For thousands of years, people have told stories about strange experiences that we cannot explain. Stories that conflict with our understanding of reality. Some of those stories found their way into print to be read by hundreds, thousands, or even millions of readers before being consigned to the oblivion of the archives. In this series, we dust off forgotten newspaper clippings, magazine articles, and letters from the library of the late Gary Mangiacopra, one of the most prolific collectors of strange stories in the world. Join us as we uncover the forgotten secrets of the archive. Exhibit 1 is an item from Box 1, Folder 33 of the Gary Mangiacopra Archive. This folder contains stories written by Gary Mangiacopra himself, along with co-author Dwight G. Smith, for the magazine The Anomalist, edited and published by Patrick Wieg and Dennis Stacy. This particular article was published in the winter 1995-1996 issue, or Volume 3, of that publication. This story is perhaps the most comprehensive dissertation on the Gloacus, a mysterious predator said to haunt the forests of New England. The following is a slightly condensed summary of Gary Mangiacopra and Dwight Smith's intriguing article on this elusive cryptid, or hidden animal. Enjoy. The New England puma, also known as the New England mountain lion, cougar, panther, or catamount, was believed to have been wiped out in the 19th century. However, there have been sporadic sightings in recent years, including reports of mysterious black panthers. These sightings raise questions about the true identity of these enigmatic felines. Eyewitnesses from all over the United States, including Connecticut, claim to have encountered these Black Panther-like creatures. Historical records from the Hartford Current and the New York Times reveal a history of Puma and Black Panther sightings in Connecticut spanning three decades. Known as the Glastonbury Gloacus, this cryptozoological phenomenon captivated the public, the various sightings being connected by a thread of uncanny similarity. The story begins in Glastonbury, a town in Hartford County, Connecticut, in the weeks leading up to January 15, 1939, locals were plagued by spine-chilling cries from a mysterious creature that seemed to possess the traits of both a dog and a feline. Witness accounts led to speculations that the mysterious creature could be a mountain lion. A hunting party led by Charles Allshouse, the game warden of Hartford County, was organized for the purpose of investigating these encounters. The party included a trained cat hound from the Ozarks. Despite the hound picking up the trail and tracks of a feline, the pursuit was hindered by the tracks of two local hounds. After an eight-mile trek, the hunters returned empty-handed, except for a fox they shot along the way. The identity of the creature became a matter of speculation and debate in Glastonbury. Most believed it to be a mountain lion although the official record stated that pumas were no longer present in Connecticut. Some suggested it could be a rare Canada lynx or a more common bobcat, but the local residents, who were familiar with the wildlife, disagreed. Rumors spread throughout Glastonbury, some suggesting the creature was a carnivorous monster that had escaped from a menagerie. Others speculated that it was a mountain lion that had been freed from a Vermont zoo during a recent storm. The possibility that the creature had found a food source in the local rabbit population gave credence to the mystery. In an attempt to find answers, Warden All's house organized another hunt in the snowy hills of Glastonbury. Despite their efforts, the hunters were unable to find any trace of the elusive creature. Disheartened, they named it the Glastonbury Gloacus on account of its habitat and elusive nature. The aftermath of the hunt sent a wave of unease through the town of Glastonbury. One night, a resident's hound returned home in a pitiful state, covered in injuries that proved fatal. Farmers later discovered a scene of struggle in the woods, marked by red-stained snow. More sightings followed. A citizen came across the mysterious creature in a woodland clearing, 
describing it as feline-like with a long furry tail. The wildcat observed the witness before disappearing soundlessly into the forest. The creature didn't limit its haunts to the woods, but also startled people on highways, as reported by the chief of police. The sightings were so numerous that patrol cars were sent to pursue the apparition. A third hunt was organized, the participants being armed with rifles and shotguns. Just before the hunt, a goat disappeared, another suspected victim of the Gloacus. Deacon Wells Strickland of the Buckingham Congregational Church provided a detailed description of the creature, which he claimed had a feline face and a long tail. Eyewitness accounts influenced John P. Benson's somewhat inscrutable opinion that the Gloacus resembled a large wildcat rather than a mountain lion. Similar sightings were reported in Nebraska. The news attracted attention from journalists who sought updates from the police chief. Sightings continued in Glastonbury. Mrs. Charles Bell reported her greyhound's injuries from a run-in with the creature. A woodsman encountered a colossal creature while setting a snare. The wildcat quickly vanished into the wilderness after being seen. Rhoda D. Herrick spotted a sinuous figure on the New London Turnpike, its tawny figure melting into the surrounding bush. The start of a monumental fourth expedition marked a significant turning point in this mysterious saga. A hunter named A. Joseph Bonvouloir, accompanied by the brave Bogey brothers and their loyal coon hounds, stumbled upon a puzzling creature in the woods. Determined to track down the elusive animal, they gave chase with one of their dogs. However, when Bonvouloir fired his gun, the creature vanished into the woods, covering remarkable distances with each stride. Bonvouloir was left bewildered, recounting his encounter with a powerful black creature that strongly resembled a panther. The strangeness of his account was further compounded by the fact that other witnesses had described the creature as having a tawny hue, similar to a mountain lion. As time went on, more reports emerged supporting Bonvouloir's claim, including one account stretching back into the mists of history. In the Remarkable Occurrences for January 1685, written by the respected Puritan clergyman Cotton Mather, a thrilling tale unfolded. Shuba L. Smith, a servant of the esteemed Mr. John Hollister and a renowned builder of stone forts, witnessed a monstrous creature by the riverside. This towering tiger stood seven feet tall, with a single horn on its forehead, reminiscent of a unicorn, talons like those of a harpy, and an unusually long tail with a bluish-gray tint. This creature, named Monstrum in fandom Gallinobacchus, or a strange monster Gallinobacchus, by the wise pastor of Wethersfield, served as a testament to the enduring mystery that has captivated the imaginations of New Englanders. In a more recent confirmation of Bonvouloir's sighting of a Black Panther, a local resident shared his own encounter with a Hartford newspaper. During a hunt in the Buckingham district of Glastonbury, he and his two brothers were startled by a glossy black creature emerging from the thickets. The creature was about three feet long with a sinuous two foot long tail. The beast stood just a few steps away from them, prompting one of the men to take aim. Unfortunately, his gun misfired and the creature bounded away. The game warden, All's House, obtained a canine named Lead a mix of Irish Setter, Airedale, and Ozark Coon Dog to track down the elusive Gloacus. However, Leed's reaction upon catching the scent of the quarry revealed great unease as he barked and ran across the uneven terrain. The hunting party eventually found Leed whimpering in front of a stone wall. Such behavior was highly unusual, especially coming from a hound trained to pursue wildcats suggesting that the creature Leed encountered was unlike any prey he had encountered before. There is no doubt that Glastonbury was witness to a series of strange sightings and sounds related to large felines over a period of five to six weeks. However, starting on Sunday, January 22, 1939, the serious pursuit of the Gloacus began to be met with ridicule. The townspeople's inability to capture or even catch a glimpse of this black creature on two separate occasions caused a shift in the tone of the local newspaper reports, 
with reporters adopting a more light-hearted approach to the dispatches coming from Glastonbury. The fifth and final attempt to track down the elusive Glowacus culminated on Tuesday, January 24th in the area known as Dark Hollow, not far from the town of Marlborough. This terrain was characterized by a maze of thorns, fallen trees, and treacherous cliffs. Amidst the waning interest of the hunters, the press remained steadfast in their enthusiasm. A well-known journalist and chronicler named Lowell Thomas informed his radio listeners on that very same evening that the mysterious creature plaguing Glastonbury had been given the name Glowacus by a scientist from Connecticut. In fact, this so-called scholar was actually just the assistant state editor of the Hartford Current newspaper. Despite the expectation that the Glowacas would fade into obscurity after a week and a half of intense media coverage, the creature re-emerged on Thursday, January 26th. A resident of Columbia named Mary Romanick witnessed the creature as it made its way southward along the Hartford Willimantic Highway near the Wyndham town line. Romanic urgently asked a service station attendant named Ernest Hart to report her sighting of a black beast with a long tail resembling a panther to the Willimantic police. Three days later, on January 30th, the Hartford Current published a fabricated photograph depicting a buckwackus, a perversion of the name they had recently coined, claiming that it had been captured alive while entangled in a tall tree. Esteemed naturalist Howard Cleves sarcastically declared that this creature was not the real Glowacus. As amusement continued to be generated by Glastonbury's most enigmatic resident, another prank unfolded on February 5th, 1939. A bird-like replica of the elusive creature, constructed from baling wire, cardboard, turkey feathers, and a long golden beak, was hung from the top floor of the former Hartford Etna Bank building to deter starlings. In a letter to the Hartford Courant on the same day, Frank Ray from West Simsbury proposed that his red setter dog, with its large paws, may have unknowingly sparked reports of the Glowacus. Ray speculated that his dog, known to wander into the wilderness with neighboring hunting dogs and return with the remains of a goat, and, on another occasion, an ox's hoof and limb may have created the purported Glowacus tracks. It seemed that the depredations of roaming dogs could explain the disappearance of certain livestock that had mistakenly been attributed to the Glowacus. On February 8th, the proposal put forth by Representative Alan F. Benke to establish Glastonbury as an exclusive sanctuary for the Glowacus failed to gain legislative approval. It is worth noting that Benke had received letters from as far away as Texas, Missouri, and even Washington, D.C., claiming the presence of similar creatures in their own wild landscapes. On the tranquil morning of February 24th, the Andover woods were bathed in a gentle glow. It was in the midst of this serenity that Mr. Harold Roberts, a resident of East Hartford, made a remarkable discovery, fresh cloacus tracks. These tracks, measuring four inches in width, meandered for two miles, leading eastward from Glastonbury's Diamond Lake. The distinct paw prints, believed to belong to a mountain lion, revealed a creature with purposeful strides. The absence of deer in the area and the remnants of rabbits suggested the presence of a lurking predator hidden in the shadows. This discovery marked the final tangible evidence of the elusive Glowacus for the winter of 1939. One might have assumed that with the onset of World War II, the mystery surrounding this creature would fade into the depths of folklore. However, fate had other plans. Fifteen years later, these mysterious pumas and black panthers would once again emerge, casting their enigmatic shadow upon the land. During the Second World War, the Hartford Current refrained from reporting on feline apparitions in Connecticut. However, it did captivate its readers with tales of similar sightings from distant corners of the United States. One such story, on September 22, 1946, told of a group of 150 armed men in Okawak, Illinois. These men embarked on a valiant but ultimately futile mission to find the mysterious, cat-like beasts that had instilled fear in their small village of 800 inhabitants. The search involved a dozen coon hounds and three low-flying airplanes scouring the densely wooded area across three miles. 
Unfortunately, their efforts yielded no captures, despite multiple sightings of creatures reportedly measuring seven feet in length and two feet in height. Although the creatures hadn't harmed any humans, there were reports of a significant decline in the village's poultry population. District Conservation Inspector Guy Taylor of North Henderson, Illinois, interviewed those who claimed to have witnessed these creatures and became convinced of their extraordinary nature. Various explanations were offered to account for these sightings, ranging from pumas and colossal lynx, to a more exotic wildcat released by a traveling circus due to food scarcity during the war. The resurgence of the Connecticut Gloacus was heralded by sightings in Mansfield during the mid-1950s. One notable sighting occurred near the Mansfield Hollow Dam project, witnessed by Willimantic resident Lionel Rock and his companions. On August 3, 1954, they spotted a gargantuan, feline-like entity, similar in size to a Great Dane, with a distinctive swooping tail that ended in a tuft of white hair. They watched in awe as it approached a section of the dam before bounding away, leaving an indelible impression upon their senses. Another intriguing sighting took place the following evening in the picturesque village of Willimantic. Joseph Hemingway, a resident of this serene town, ventured out in search of the enigmatic creature. To his surprise, he witnessed its agile form darting through a marshland near the dam. An experienced puma hunter, Hemingway confidently identified the creature as a cougar. However, Thomas E. Rose, a ranger from the State Department of Fisheries and Game, expressed skepticism and attributed the sighting to an optical illusion. Some had less conservative theories. Members of the Glastonbury Sportsmen's Club, for instance, suggested that the creature could be a pterodactyl, the flying relic of a prehistoric age. They claimed to have encountered this creature firsthand in the Connecticut forests. One club member, James Kinney, recounted his experience on December 21, 1955, when he claimed to have come face to face with a solemn-looking creature with a wingspan of approximately six feet. Another club member, Robinson Gilbert, spotted the creature while out on a horse ride. This sighting led to an intense pursuit on January 21, 1956. But unfortunately, Gilbert and his companions were unable to capture any evidence of the elusive creature. In the aftermath of Christmas in 1957, Mrs. Hugh A. McIntyre of Granby, Connecticut, observed a sleek black creature resembling a panther on Route 20 at 10 o'clock in the evening. The creature moved with a relaxed air of nonchalance as it made its way across the meadows, disguised by the tall grass. Its long tail added to its mysterious appearance. Several brave huntsmen ventured into the rain-soaked woodlands of West Granby in search of the creature, but returned empty-handed. Lyle Thorpe, steward of the State Board of Fisheries and Game, theorized that if a panther had indeed been present, it must have escaped from a traveling menagerie that had passed through the area. However, Ralph L. Emerson, owner of the Emerson Wild Animal Farm, quickly dismissed this explanation, asserting that none of his animals had escaped. Two years later, in the summer of 1959, a series of attacks occurred in the rural area of Granby. It started in May, when a horse in a pasture in Granville, Massachusetts, just beyond Connecticut's borders, valiantly protected her newborn foal, but suffered injuries in the process. Shortly after, a yearling heifer on Leroy Dewey's West Granby estate fell victim to a vicious attack and had to be put down. In a disturbing turn of events, a group of 20 young animals at Dewey's other property scattered in panic, causing chaos. It is worth noting that these two properties were only five miles apart. The attacks continued, claiming the lives of three sheep on Stanford Higgins land. The wounds inflicted on these animals bore the unmistakable marks of a clawed predator. Nearby, tracks were found that were larger than those typically associated with a bobcat or lynx. Curiously, Higgins' farm was located near Dewey Sr.'s estate, connecting their fates in this mysterious saga. Two dogs vanished from a neighboring homestead, further heightening anxiety in the community. Adding to the unease, unsettling wails echoed across Granby on subsequent nights, indicating the presence of a distressed wild creature. Finally, on June 18th, the enigmatic predator responsible for these attacks was sighted. Walter M. Silkey, 
a witness traveling along Route 20 in West Granby glimpsed a creature resembling a panther. Measuring three feet in length, with unique features like small pointed ears and a long tail, this creature weaved through the area, mere miles from the location where Mrs. McIntyre encountered a similar panther in 1957. The next day, a significant encounter took place in Granby. Hans Gropper, the caretaker of Granby's dogs, found himself just 150 feet away from a dark-furred feline creature while walking on Simsbury Road. The creature measured three feet in length, with a long, sinuous tail ending in a blunt tip. It crossed the road and disappeared into the nearby foliage. Groper, deeply affected by the experience, embarked on a passionate quest for knowledge and validation in the following months, hoping to gain the attention of scholars. Unfortunately, his efforts went unnoticed, leaving him disheartened. Soon, a wave of skeptics emerged, dismissing those who had encountered these cryptic felines. One critic suggested that the creatures were not panthers, but rather a creature known as the Injun Devil in Maine folklore. Clarence Robinson, a former Maine resident, described the Injun Devil as a sable-colored wildcat, four feet in length with an elongated tail. According to Robinson, this sinister specter posed a serious threat, occasionally attacking unsuspecting individuals, especially during full moons. Despite these speculations, the attacks on farm animals continued, attributed to the enigmatic killer cat of Granby. On July 3rd, Darwin Hughes stumbled upon the remains of a heifer displaying clear signs of a violent demise, similar to another unfortunate bovine that met the same fate two weeks prior. A witness also reported seeing a massive dark figure darting across Route 20, prompting state game director Errol Lamsons and dog warden Hans Groper to pursue the fleeting tracks of this mysterious phantom. News of a mysterious feline marauder spread through the towns of Granby, Union, and Simsbury. George McKean, a resident of Avon and a salesman for the esteemed Hartford Current, recounted his encounter with a ruddy brown animal measuring about four feet in length. It happened at the stroke of 2 a.m. when the animal halted under the beam of McKean's headlights. It quickly darted away as he turned the corner to deliver the daily paper, flashing a tail reminiscent of a fox, but much larger in size. Two days later, on July 5th, rumors circulated that the elusive killer cat was lurking in West Simsbury. Three unsuccessful panther hunts were organized in pursuit of this enigmatic creature. Later that same evening, Dorothy Clapp and her family in North Granby were awakened by a thunderous roar at 1 a.m originating from approximately 200 feet away. Clapp compared the sound to a lion's roar, but higher in pitch, like that of a raccoon, accompanied by a resonating feline hiss. In an attempt to scare away the creature, Albert Bloomberg fired his 22 caliber rifle into the night. Prompted by the unsettling clamor, a group of brave individuals rose to the occasion. John Monteith, Harlan Hansen of Granby, William Miller of Winchester, accompanied by his loyal hound, and the intrepid William Rosgen of Winstead. This determined quartet followed the elusive tracks for nearly a mile, crossing Route 189 twice, until the hound lost the scent. Unfortunately, their pursuit came to an end when the sun rose, yielding no results. A renewed effort was made in West Simsbury that afternoon, after three keen witnesses reported seeing the creature. The first to spot it was young Larry Graham, a 12-year-old boy. While retrieving a toy from the back of his house, he spotted the creature resting on the grass, a mere 100 feet from the doorstep, near the family's garbage disposal area. Startled by Larry's presence, the creature bounded away into the nearby woods. Larry rushed inside to inform Mrs. Clayton Pirro, who was looking after the children. He described the creature as larger than a collie dog and completely black. Disturbed by this revelation, Piro quickly took her children inside and called the authorities. Patrolman brothers Earl and Robert Higley responded to the alarm, venturing out to investigate the reports. Earl had a confirmed sighting of the creature as he walked along a dirt path near the woods across from the Graham residence. The creature suddenly leaped into view, revealing a shadowy form around four feet long and two and a half feet tall. 
Mrs. Graham from her home also glimpsed the creature. Although the distance made it difficult to make out specific details, she also described it as sleek and black. The Granby Killer Cat gained such notoriety that attorney William Pease had to intervene to restrain the eager hunters, many of whom came from distant counties armed with powerful rifles. Six hunters faced reprimand for violating local hunting statutes, bringing an end to this curious chapter in Granby's history. Around the same time, three young boys, Kurt Rush from West Hartford and Brian Mahoney and Tom Washnock from Farmington, reported seeing a large black feline near Route 75, close to Bradley Field. Policeman Edwin Sheldon bravely ventured to the area but found no trace of the enigmatic creature after a thorough, hour-long search. Despite numerous daily reports of sightings and the loss of farm animals, State Fish and Game Director Lyle G. Thorpe remained convinced in the probability of a conventional explanation. He believed that the depredations and sightings could be explained by stray dogs, dismissing the claims of cat-like creatures as mere figments of the imagination. One July evening, shortly after the Bradley Field incident, a young boy named Kurt Larson applied the knowledge he learned from scouting in an attempt to identify the eerie cries that echoed through the area. Playing his guitar, Larson attracted the attention of a puma, which responded with mournful howls. Drawing from his experience as a Boy Scout, during which he had learned to recognize the sounds of wild animals, Larson concluded that the cries were, indeed, the cries of a puma. Accompanied by his friend Howard Langdon, Larson discovered two sets of tracks in the area from which the haunting cries had issued. One set of tracks belonged to a large creature, while the other was from a smaller creature. Unfortunately, when Hans Groper arrived to investigate the tracks, they had already been erased by the weather and farming activities. The concerned citizens of Granby, including the rural inhabitants and farmers, became increasingly frustrated with the state fish and game department officials who dismissed their worries about the possible presence of pumas or cougars in the area. Eventually, the citizens sought help from Governor Ribicoff's office. A tuft of hair found near a dead cow owned by Darwin Hughes had reportedly been sent for analysis at the University of Connecticut two weeks prior. But conservation officer John Samalis had not provided any results. In addition, John Montieth shared that a representative from the State Fish and Game Department seemed uninterested in the situation. On July 13, 1959, Lester Loomis, a farmer from Simsbury, lamented the loss of a calf's tail, which had been gruesomely stripped to the bone. Just days later, the mysterious New England wildcat narrowly escaped gunfire once again. On a fateful Friday evening at Windswept Acres Farm, owned by Dr. Robert J. Sadler in Barkhamstead, the creature was spotted prowling near a pond filled with waterfowl. Richard, one of Sadler's sons, quickly ran into the house and told the family about the feline-like creature. Determined to protect their property, Richard and his brother Robert fired five shots at the creature, but missed every time. Thirty minutes later, the elusive creature returned. Richard, finished with his dinner, ventured into the hayfield again to search for any signs of its presence before darkness fell. With his trusty Winchester rifle in hand, he saw the creature about 50 feet away. Before he could take aim, however, the panther skillfully retreated into the thick forest. Under the cover of night, the creature revealed itself again around 10 o'clock. Robert Stadler, an experienced veterinarian, used his flashlight to explore the darkness and caught sight of a pair of glowing green eyes about two to three hundred yards away. This time, the earth bore clear evidence of the creature's passing. During the following weekend, Hans Groper oversaw the delicate process of preserving the creature's paw prints in paraffin. From the paraffin blocks, molds of the prints were made. These impressions were then sent to Ralph Palmer, a respected zoologist from Albany, New York. On July 22nd, Palmer examined the plaster casts and conclusively identified the prints as belonging to a canine species. Meanwhile, the tuft of tawny fur found entangled in barbed wire near one of the dead cows was analyzed by Abraham Stolman, a renowned toxicologist who determined it to be from a red fox. It seemed the fox had been drawn to the deceased cattle for an opportunistic meal. 
Palmer did, however, declare that the secondary prints of the killer cats, obtained on July 19th, were undoubtedly from a feline. Further classification was elusive, but Palmer was certain they did not match the prints of a lynx or a bobcat. This finding added weight to Hans Groper's claim of spotting a massive cat asserting its dominance in the Granby area. The dispute between the officials of Granby Township and two state agencies regarding the mysterious killer cat continued despite the passing of a month. After diligent investigation, state investigators discovered canine fur at the scenes of two cattle mutilations. Groper suspected that the work might be attributable to a pack of wild dogs. The officials initially pursued this theory, but ultimately settled for a pair of roving canines. Unfortunately, the evidence did not support the idea that these dogs were responsible for the attacks. The incidents occurred near human habitations, where the barking of dogs should have been heard. Additionally, the injuries on the neck, dorsal and forelimbs, and the fractured spinal columns of the deceased animals suggested the work of a feline. Groper is quoted as remarking that he would like to see the dog capable of leaping onto a cow's back. By the end of the summer of 1959, the second series of sightings came to a close. No further incidents were reported, but accounts of a similar creature sighted 90 years earlier emerged. On August 21, 1869, the Tallinn County Journal documented the concern of Uniontown residents near Lake Mashapog, who were disturbed by the presence of a true Scotland devil. One man, upon encountering this mysterious creature, hurried home in such fear that he could not provide a coherent description of the apparition. Later, a young observer of 16 or 17 years saw it while transporting hay along the road. Although filled with dread, the boy described the subject of his sighting as about the size of a large Newfoundland dog, black, with a face resembling a feline's, and having massive paws and elongated claws. The creature approached him until he shouted, at which point it turned, jumped over the fence, and disappeared into the woods. Others claimed to have heard its nocturnal noises, while reports of slaughtered sheep, lambs, and calves came from the towns of Brimfield and Stafford. The Granby Panther reared its head again in 1960, initiating a third series of sightings that would last for seven years. In May of 1960, a Granby resident reported seeing a feline-like creature weighing an impressive 100 pounds seeking shelter in his garage. The following October brought the discovery of a peculiar carcass resembling a small bear or a remarkably large raccoon. Found by Peter Marhefke on the outskirts of a field in Collinsville during a hunting expedition, it possessed a face reminiscent of a gorilla, a tail resembling that of a dog, and a coat like steel wool. Initially believed to be of canid descent by James Bishop, a respected game biologist at the State Department of Fisheries and Game in Farmington, doubts arose when the creature's mange-ridden coat displayed hues of sable and russet. Weighing a substantial 120 pounds, it defied classification as a raccoon, bearing closer resemblance to a small bear, except for its incongruous three-foot-long tail and two-foot stature. The events of October 1962 evoked memories of the events that unfolded in 1959. In the days leading up to October 23rd, Oxford experienced a wave of attacks attributed to a wildcat, culminating in the killing of pheasants and three cattle. During a horseback ride, 15-year-old Sandy Gladding from Southbury found herself attacked by what appeared to be a puma, which launched itself from a towering tree. The horse initially reared, dislodging the cat, and fled in terror, leaving the unharmed girl to recount her horrifying encounter with the mystery feline. In Harwinton, two 150-pound Harlequin Great Danes, accustomed to traveling in pairs, were brutally attacked in broad daylight near attorney Paul Smith's home. After hearing terrifying screams, Smith's wife discovered the dogs covered in blood in a field. One of the dogs had a chunk of its head chewed off. Upon examination by a vet, it was discovered that each dog had 30 or 40 puncture wounds, not slashes. These two attacks prompted a widespread search on October 26th involving troopers from the Bethany Barracks, officials from the Fish and Game Commission, and numerous hunters with the assistance of bloodhounds. 
on the night of Sunday the 26th, a panther attacked Thomaston resident Edward R. Sanford, leaving scratches on his back and chest and tearing his clothes. The director of the State Board of Fisheries and Game, Lyle M. Thorpe, declared his conviction that the mysterious animal causing havoc in the Woodbury-Southbury-Oxford area was a panther, specifically a black leopard brought into the state by someone. Theodore B. Bampton, the district supervisor in Bethlehem, collected eyewitness reports describing the animal as a black panther, approximately three feet long, with a similarly long upturned tail and small ears. The panther moved close to the ground and exhibited incredible speed. The following Monday, a donkey was killed at Jerome Shaw's farm in Southbury. State police determined that the hamstrings of its leg had been torn by the attacker, leaving it crippled. That night, Edward Orlowski Sr. of Terryville spotted the panther while driving along Todd Hollow Road. The animal ran across the road, appearing to be approximately three and a half feet long and 18 to 20 inches tall with a long tail. Orlowski returned home, retrieved Alexander Gromashak, guns and a dog, and attempted to find the panther in the heavily wooded, hilly area. The pair were unsuccessful. State troopers also searched the area, but could not locate the animal. On November 1st, Ruth Cheney, the esteemed director of the Children's Museum of Hartford, speculated that the descriptions of the panther in Connecticut resembled those of the rare melanistic African leopard, a genetic anomaly born with a solid black coat. She further proposed that the elusive panther might be an escaped domesticated feline. Fugitive or not, the wily ebony cat was spotted by a farmer in the Washington Hill precinct of East Heartland on that same day. Theodore Legite, a 60-year-old man, recounted the encounter in meticulous detail. He observed the creature from his kitchen window at approximately 7.30 in the morning. It was ascending a rise in the land around 500 feet away from his home. It moved swiftly with a graceful trot-like gait distinct from that of a canine. The panther's path took it to a pasture where nine young heifers were grazing on his nephew's farm. Two weeks prior, a black Angus had disappeared from the same enclosure and was never found. Initially, the feline approached Legite, but suddenly changed direction and rapidly crossed the area, disappearing from view over the crest of a hill on the other side of the pasture. The ebony-hued creature measured three feet long and two feet tall with a tail longer than two feet. State Trooper Victor Zordon of the Canaan Barracks was called to search the area around the pasture but found no trace of the black beast. This sighting in East Heartland was approximately 35 miles away from the Woodbury-Southbury-Oxford region, where a similar creature had been spotted the previous Monday. On the following Sunday, hunters combed the dense woodland and mountainous terrain in Terryville in pursuit of the mysterious prowling cat. It had been a full week since anyone had caught a glimpse of the legendary panther. But on a Sunday in November, Gus Carnivalini and his wife spotted the elusive creature in Colebrook. They immediately reported their five-minute observation to the constabulary. The panther was stealthily prowling through the lush green grass, occasionally pausing to stare at them. The Carnivalinis stumbled upon this breathtaking sight during a leisurely drive, finding the panther in a field off Penny Road at around 4.30 in the afternoon. They brought their vehicle to a stop and watched as the panther lay behind a snow fence in the meadow grass. When Gus closed the car door, the creature stirred and slowly moved through the grass. Mr. Carnivalini let out a feline-like growl, causing the panther to briefly pause and acknowledge them. It then made its way across the field and disappeared behind a stone wall. Both Mr. and Mrs. Carnivalini described the panther as a cat the size of a German shepherd with a foot-long tail and a pure black coat. Despite initial reservations, the couple decided to report their encounter out of concern for the safety of the local youth who might be put at risk by this magnificent creature. The following day, a huntsman named Anthony Shaleski of Winstead managed to take down a 23-pound wildcat in the woods of Colebrook. But this was not the panther that had captured everyone's attention. Subsequently, more bobcats were killed. With a few exceptions, the ebony panther of Connecticut evaded newspaper headlines for a full two years. This spell was broken one night in November 1963 when three Winstead policemen came across a breathtaking sight. 
While patrolling, they saw a gigantic black, cat-like creature dart across Main Street and disappear into a field near the Mad River. One of the officers, David Piquigno, managed to illuminate the creature with his flashlight, revealing its impressive size. The officers unanimously described it as three feet long with a height of 18 inches and a tail nearly a foot and a half long. On a tranquil Thursday morning in November 1967, a prominent executive named Thorvald Hammer, the husband of Senator Lucy Hammer, witnessed a most extraordinary sight. As he enjoyed his morning meal, an enigmatic creature paraded down his driveway with an air of regal confidence. Intrigued, Thorvald stepped outside to observe the creature's stately promenade along a secluded path. Eventually, it disappeared from sight around a bend. Alarmed by this strange visitation, Thorvald promptly reported the sighting to the authorities. A formidable team of police officers and game wardens armed themselves with shotguns and rifles, embarked on an intense search of the estate. The search party was later unsettled by a loud roar emanating from the depths of the woods, sending shivers down their spines. Despite the unwavering efforts of tracking dogs, their hunt yielded no results except for the peculiar discovery of a mutilated squirrel near a pond. Such was the alarming nature of these events that precautions were taken to ensure the safety of nearby children at their bus stop. An armed sentinel was deployed and nearby horses were discreetly relocated to a place of refuge. The enigmatic visitor remained a mystery, leaving the town of Colebrook on edge, wondering about its origins and intentions. More drama unfolded on a somber Monday in November when authorities were summoned to investigate reports of a baby tiger roaming the West Hills section of New Haven. A fleet of police cruisers responded swiftly to the alarming report given by a bus driver named Joe Hunahan, who had a disconcerting encounter with the mysterious creature as it strolled through the area. This sighting followed a previous encounter with the Thorvald Tiger in Branford, 10 miles to the east. After the incident in New Haven, there were no further mentions of the enigmatic visitor in Connecticut. The puzzling zoological events that occurred in Connecticut over several decades warrant closer examination. Despite ruling out incidents involving dogs, bobcats, and domestic or feral cats, there is still tangible evidence of feline paw prints and credible eyewitness accounts of pumas and black panthers. The credibility of these accounts is bolstered by the fact that they come from trained police officers and state conservation officials. This leaves us with a fascinating mystery. What really were these mysterious felines spotted throughout Connecticut? One possibility is that pumas have made a comeback in their former habitat in Connecticut. The state's landscape, characterized by the return of forests and the decline of cleared farmlands, provides a diverse and plentiful habitat with an abundance of prey year-round. The reappearance of coyotes in Connecticut, filling the ecological gap left by the eradication of wolves, serves as a relevant example of how ecosystems can change over time. Given these transformations, it is reasonable to consider the return of pumas. Another more controversial theory suggests that captive pumas may have been introduced into the Connecticut wilderness, either intentionally or accidentally. As the cost and risks associated with keeping these animals increased, it is conceivable that some were released into the wild. Over time, these former captives may have adapted to their new environment and successfully reproduced with wild pumas. Both of these theories help explain the reports of tawny-colored pumas observed by witnesses, However, the sightings of coal or jet black panthers remain a mystery. Two conflicting theories attempt to shed light on this phenomenon. The first theory proposes the existence of a melanistic subspecies of pumas that coexist with the conventionally tawny Felis concolor. However, without verified evidence of melanistic pumas, this theory remains unproven. The idea that the sightings of black panthers in Connecticut could be the result of escaped jaguars or leopards released into the wild has gained some traction. It is suggested that after being released, these animals could have adapted to their new environment and remained hidden due to the potential legal consequences for their previous owners. The presence of melanistic jaguars and panthers could explain the reports of black panthers over the past few decades, 
However, this theory does not explain the sightings of tawny pumas or resolve the mystery of Black Panther sightings. It remains a subject of controversy and speculation. Notably, respected researchers Lauren Coleman and Mark A. Hall have documented numerous instances of Black Panther and lion sightings dating back to the 18th century in the United States and Canada. These occurrences cannot simply be attributed to introduced foreign felines. As a result, two cryptozoological theories have emerged to explain the phenomenon of Black Panthers. One suggests that the sightings could indicate the presence of relict populations of the giant American lion, which existed until around 10,000 years ago. The other theory proposes that the creatures could be manifestations of the saber-tooth cat, a formidable predator that lived alongside the dire wolf and North American jaguar during the Pleistocene era. These creatures hunted large herbivores that roamed North America during the Ice Ages. However, the saber-tooth cat and other Ice Age fauna disappeared roughly 8,500 years ago, coinciding with the end of the Ice Age and the arrival of North American Indians. The reasons for their disappearance are still unknown. Overall, the mystery of Black Panther sightings in Connecticut remains unsolved, with several intriguing theories, but no definitive answers. There are other items in Box 1, Folder 33 of the Gary Mangiacopra Archive, all of them articles for the Anomalist magazine written by Gary Mangiacopra and Dwight Smith. One of the articles explores a 1947 collision between a passenger steamer called the SS Santa Clara and what witnesses described as a sea serpent. The other chronicles a convoluted saga of the Phantom of Broad Mountain, a specter once believed to haunt the scene of a grisly murder. If you would like to read these stories and other items in the Gary Mangiacopra archive, please click on the link in the description.